You may recall a movement that started in America in the 1980s that had groups of men coming together for nature workshops, drumming and storytelling as a way of dealing with their emotional issues. One of the chief figures of that movement was philosopher and award-winning poet Robert Bly. His story is interesting enough, having long been involved in the women's rights movement and a strong advocate of gender equality throughout the 1960s and 70s. But eventually he began to turn his attention and poetry to the dysfunctional masculinity and spiralling levels of depression and suicide he was seeing in men of all ages throughout the United States. He attributed this crisis to the absence of male role models, and in particular, the father, in the post-industrial collapse of both rural and urban communities that has characterised Western societies since the 18th century. This study led him to the further study of mythology, stories and tribal rituals in pre-industrial societies. He also drew from the rich tapestry of European folk stories and fairy tales, such as the collected works of the Brothers Grimm. One story in particular stood out for him as being a coded initiation guide of potentially great instruction for men. It was the story of Der Eisenhans, or Iron John in English, and it formed the basis of a bestseller book he wrote of the same name, available these days in both audiobook and PDF forms that you can search and download for yourself online. In today's video, we'll be looking at the story of Iron John and how it might prove instructive for men in their development today. Whoever went into that forest never came back. A number of hunters that had ventured to enter in search of game for the king's table had failed to return. When the king sent others to find them, they disappeared also. The forest soon became associated with an ominous and sinister energy and no human dared to enter. One day, a brave and adventurous hunter from another land was travelling through the kingdom on a quest to slay monsters and save damsels in distress, and asked the king if he was in need of any pest control. The king happened to mention the dark forest and its sinister secrets, and suggested that might be a good place to find trouble. The hunter excitedly made his way toward the forest, accompanied only by his dog and some retainers. As they wound their way through the thick undergrowth, they eventually came across a deep pond. Suddenly, an arm reached out of the pond, grabbing the dog by one of its legs and pulling him under. The hunter, unfazed, thought to himself, this must be the place. So he quickly backtracked to the castle, relayed the information to the king, and then, with the assistance of another two men of the king's guard and a number of buckets, returned to the pond and began bucketing out the water to drain the pond. They scooped deeper and deeper until they eventually came to the deepest part of the pond in which they found a man lying there with bronze-coloured rough skin and covered in long, matted, rust-coloured hair from head to toe. They seized him, bound him in ropes and conveyed him back to the castle where he was imprisoned in an iron cage displayed for all to see in the courtyard. The townsfolk gawked and stared at this wild man and they soon gave him the name Iron John on account of his ruddy complexion and rust-coloured hair. There was only one key to the cage and the king gave it for safekeeping to the queen. Now, the king and queen had a young son 
about eight years old, who had a golden ball, of which he was very fond and played with constantly. One day he was playing in the vicinity of the cage when he fumbled the ball and it rolled towards the cage where it was picked up by Iron John. The young prince approached the cage and asked to have it back. Iron John, never having spoken until now, replied, of course, if you let me out. The boy just turned and ran away. We are told all of our lives not to let the wild man out of the cage. Not only that, but we must not even speak to him. Some days later, the prince once again approached the cage and asked Iron John for his ball back. Yes, he replied again, if you let me out of my cage. Again, the prince doesn't even answer, but the look of frustration grows deeper on his face. Anyway, a few days later, the boy once again approaches the cage. Again, and this time for the third time, mythological transformations often happen over three days, the prince asks Iron John for his golden ball. As before, Iron John replies, yes, if you let me out of my cage. Now, frustrated and angry, the prince says to the wild man, even if I wanted to let you out, I don't know where the key is. The wild man leaned over to him and whispered, it's under your mother's pillow. Something that wouldn't surprise Sigmund Freud at all. Mothers raise their boys to be nice boys, good boys. That's the same thing as saying, the key to the wild man's cage is under your mother's pillow. The same place she makes love to her husband. So one day, while his parents were away, the prince snuck into his parents' bedchamber and stole the key from under his mother's pillow. Cautiously, he approached the cage, inserting the key. But as he turned it in its rusty lock, it was harder than expected, and he slipped, injuring his finger badly on the lock. It finally gave a loud clunk, and the door groaned as it opened on its grating hinges. Iron John stepped out of the cage and turned to make his way back to the forest. The boy now cried out after him, Wait! If my parents come home and find you out of your cage, they will beat me. Yes, you're right, said Iron John. They surely will. I suppose you had better come with me then. So he picked up the boy, swung him onto his shoulder and took him into the forest. This kidnapping is symbolic of the act of male initiators in a tribal society, taking a boy away from the influence and comforts of his mother to initiate him into the world of men. Boys between the ages of 8 and 12 have been stolen away from their mothers in this way since time immemorial, often not seeing her again until maybe two years later, as they are mentored in the arts of survival by other men in the tribe or forced to live in the wild by their wits, as do the Maasai in Tanzania. Today, boys in our society have no such pivotal event in their lives. Anyway, Iron John takes the prince deep into the forest, to his home by a sacred spring which he guards. All mystical forests have such a sacred wellspring, guarded by powerful spirits. The boy was now very tired and drifted off to sleep soon after they got there. When he woke, Iron John told him, You will never see your mother and father again. The boy's face went pale as the fear washed over him. Don't worry, said Iron John, I'll take care of you. And then he bade the boy look into the pond, where he saw dozens of beautiful golden fish and snakes swimming around in its cool, clear waters. I'm going out for a while, said Iron John. Guard the spring and don't let anything fall in or touch the water until I get back. OK, said the boy. Anyway, as the afternoon wore on, the boy's finger, which he cut on the lock of the cage, had become swollen and throbbed with pain as he recalled the events of the previous day. Without thinking, he dipped it into the pond for some relief when it immediately turned gold. Astonished, he pulled the finger out of the water, but the gold wouldn't rub off. Iron John soon came along, 
after being away all day and said that he felt a premonition that something had fallen into the water. The boy sheepishly hid his finger behind his back, but I and John said, come on, let's see it. I told you, he said, not to let anything fall into the water. Don't let it happen again. Next morning, I and John went away again, but as he was leaving, he turned to the boy and said, Remember what I told you yesterday. Don't let anything touch the water. The boy nodded anxiously, determined not to repeat yesterday's mistake, as he waved him off, his golden finger glistening in the sunshine. Hours went by again, without incident, and it was getting quite warm. So he sat near to the cool rocks of the spring and ran his fingers through his hair to relieve some of his humidity. When a hair fell from his scalp and onto the surface of the water, just before he could pluck it out, and it instantly turned to gold. Sure enough, I and John soon came home and once again said he could feel something wasn't right, beckoning the prince to hand over the thing that fell in. This time, now a heavy, golden, single strand of hair. I told you yesterday not to let this happen, as the boy, like any other frustrated kid might remonstrate, by waving his arms about, intimating that it was an accident, not his fault, or any other excuse that might absolve him of blame. But I and John would have none of it, and said, You've got one more chance. I'm going out again tomorrow. Don't let anything fall into the spring. Okay, okay, said the boy, as the next day, or perhaps decade, came round again. This time, he was milling around the edge of the spring and climbing over some of the rocks, desperate to avoid stuffing up, when he noticed his reflection in the water. At first, he was satisfied with pulling faces and amusing himself with antics reflecting in the still mirror of the water. But soon enough, he wanted a closer look at himself and edged his way closer, leaning over little by little. His nostrils, his teeth, the hairs on his chin. Absorbed in the self-reflection, he leaned even closer to gaze into his own eyes, for we are all drawn at times into gazing deeply into our own souls when, to his horror, his hair flopped over his head and into the water, instantly turning gold. Once again, in a panic, he tied the heavy golden locks back under a handkerchief to hide them, terrified of what I and John would say. And yes, soon enough, I and John showed up none too impressed. You have failed in your trial, and it's now time for you to leave, he said. You cannot stay here any longer. The boy's lips quivered in disappointment. You have learned a lot about gold, but you know nothing about poverty, said Iron John. Now you must go out alone into the world. The boy's face again drained pale as he contemplated being by himself without any support. Don't worry, said the wild man. I can see you have a good heart, so I will make you a promise. I have more gold and silver than you will ever need. If you ever find yourself in trouble, just make your way back to the edge of these woods and call out my name three times. I and John, I and John, I and John, and I will come to help you. The hairy, scruffy, wild man living at the bottom of the pond represents the dark, primal, masculine forces lying repressed within the depths of our own subconscious. Water, especially deep water, is synonymous with the instinctual and unconscious world beyond intellectual control, but within which lie our most profound creative talents and spiritual insights. Bly explicitly differentiates the wild man from the savage man, whom he sees as entirely disconnected from other living things and only operating out of violent self-interest 
and appetite. The wild man, in contrast, is a man in touch with his own masculinity, sexuality and interdependence with other living things. Why Iron John? In Northern Europe, after the collapse of the Bronze Age trading routes, mining for iron ore was still rudimentary and labour-intensive. Much of the raw material was instead gathered from bog swamps, where the organic iron compounds were more easily accessed for smelting. This is why stories like the King Arthur legend have the sword Excalibur emerge from a lake or swamp, places that people also gathered peat for burning. Incidentally, the Lady of the Lake was most likely the Germanic goddess Bridget, the patron of blacksmiths, so the divine transfer of weapons and armour was often through the benevolence of such a goddess, who otherwise interacted very little with the hero of a story. Iron John, in contrast, is the opposite to this, so he can more accurately be thought of as a mentor or initiating male spirit. Hair has long been associated with sexual potency and personal unrestrained power, the display of vitality as well as breeding quality. Anthropologists have described the attractiveness to men of long, healthy hair in women as a signal of genetic fitness, and our myths and folk tales regularly associate long hair with power and desirability. Think of the biblical hero Samson and his loss of divine power when Delilah cuts his hair. Or Rapunzel, who uses her long hair to entice a prince to rescue her by climbing up her braided locks. Remember that even Jesus Christ submitted to be baptised by John the Baptist, a wild and hairy holy man who recognised the Messiah for who he was and sanctified his future mission. Both John the Baptist and shamans throughout tribal societies and even our own Paleolithic history wore animal skins, masks, bear skulls or stag horns to symbolise these primal natural forces. These important transformational events usually happen in or near an enchanted pool or a holy river in many cultures around the world. The golden ball, which appears in many fairy tales, represents, like all things gold, the brilliant life-affirming warmth of the sun and the precious idyllic unity of childhood before the indoctrination of school, the burdens of responsibility or the expectations of gender and society. Children play with their golden ball in such a carefree way that they never think it'll get lost. But it always happens that it does. The princess loses it in a frog pond and our young prince's ball rolls into the cage where it is picked up by Iron John. As a personification of the primitive forces of the unconscious, the wild man is not opposed to helping us get our golden ball back, but he won't just hand it over. The subconscious always demands a deal, and moreover, it requires a degree of earnest labour and risk-taking. We need to bucket our way down slowly and methodically in a disciplined manner to reach him, and then, when we confront him, he will give us our ball if we are prepared to steal the key and let him out of the cage. When the realisation comes that we need to integrate the forces of the wild subconscious, it inevitably challenges both the ephemeral comforts of the mother's influence as well as the rules and restrictions of the father. That is why I and John says to the boy that he will never see his mother and father again. He is now on his own journey of personal development and plunged into both the frightening and liberating world of the mysterious forest. The responsibility of looking after the spring is an admonition to take care of the things that really matter. Instinctually dipping your wound into a source of divine power that makes a finger turn gold may be a metaphor for not only healing your own traumas but more importantly, to profit in some way from them. 
The injuries to our childhood ego can be transformed into a gift for the benefit of everyone. The hands and feet are common areas of gold transfer in myths. Our hands are what we use to shape the world and make our mark. Our feet take us on the journey that expands our horizons. Many initiatory myths involve the hero receiving a wound, being healed by a magical spring and then becoming invested with solar or masculine power. Egyptians used to paint the fingernails of their dead mummies gold in expectation that it would invest the deceased person with immortality. Having turned his wound to gold, or we could say, having processed his emotional wounds, we are told in the story that he runs his fingers through his hair and that one of them falls into the water. As mentioned already, hair is symbolic of sexual power and animal instincts, but individual hairs on one's head could also represent individual characteristics or personal traits. Running his fingers through his hair may signify a stirring into more mature thinking, and occasionally one of those thoughts may become golden. It's interesting to note that despite being given his ball back, we never hear of the prince playing with it after leaving the castle with Iron John. Gold has manifested itself into a different form, directly of his body, rather than a toy or other external object. In his third day of trial, the boy once again fails and his entire head of hair turns gold, but in this trial, he was observing his own face and, more importantly, drawn to look deep into his own eyes. Most cultures associate looking into the eyes as a deeply penetrating act. People who are in a state of shame cannot hold a stare or look you square in the eye. Perhaps this third day of trial was emblematical of a deep self-reflection that is necessary to receive a reward of golden hair. This sudden personal insight needs to be hidden from the profane world who might misunderstand or even abuse it and is a typical characteristic of the ancient mystery schools that demand silence and secrecy from its initiates. The story now tells us that the boy left the forest alone and walked by beaten and unbeaten paths ever onwards until he reached a great city. Hungry and barefoot, he looked for work, but there was nothing available, as he had no skills or trade that were useful to anyone. He made his way to the palace and begged for work, similarly having no luck, until the royal cook took a liking to him and offered to let him carry wood and water and perform other menial tasks in the kitchen, particularly, we are told, raking the cinders and ashes in return for food and lodging. One day, with no other servants available, the cook ordered our boy to carry a meal to the royal table. As he approached the king, not wanting to show his golden hair, the boy kept his cap on, which was considered to be a most inappropriate transgression. The king chastised the boy for not removing the cap in his presence, but the boy answered that he had a skin lesion on his scalp. The king blasted the cook for allowing such a diseased boy into his presence and insisted on his immediate dismissal and ejection from the castle. The cook nevertheless felt sorry for the boy and arranged for him to become the gardener's servant outside. He was tasked with planting the beds, weeding and caring for the many delicate and exotic plants that were kept there. One day, during high summer, the heat became so intense while he was working that our boy took off his cap to let the breeze cool his forehead, and as his golden hair tumbled down over his shoulders, bright beams of reflected sunlight shone straight in through the chamber window of the king's daughter in the upper levels of the castle, who was so startled by the bright light she went over to investigate. 
Seeing the golden-haired boy in the garden below, she called out to him to bring her a bunch of flowers. Startled, he quickly put on his cap again and gathered some of the wildflowers at the outer perimeter of the garden. As he made his way to her chamber, he bumped into the chief gardener, who chastised him for picking such ordinary flowers for the princess and insisted he go and pick some of the finest and rarest specimens for her instead. But the boy replied that the wildflowers had a stronger fragrance and would please the princess much more. When he reached her chamber, she ignored the bouquet and instead demanded the boy take his cap off in her presence. The boy refused and told her it wouldn't be appropriate because he had the mange. Unhesitatingly, she grabbed his cap and yanked it off, revealing his golden locks. Embarrassed and startled, he rushed out of the room, but not before she grabbed him by the arm and stuffed a couple of gold coins into his hand as he fled. Not wanting to keep the coins, he gave them to the gardener's children to play with. The next day, she looked for him out of her window and again called for him to come up out of the garden and bring her some more wildflowers. Dutifully, he obeyed, and once again she reached over to pull his cap off, but this time he held it tightly with his hands and once again ran for the door, only for her to again press a few gold coins into his hands as he fled the room. Just like the day before, he gave these coins to the gardener's children to play with. The same thing happened on the third day also. He was called to bring flowers, resisted her removing his cap, and as he ran off, had some gold coins pressed into his hand as a tip for bringing her flowers, which, yet again, he gave to the gardener's children. The next step in the initiatory process, having been exposed to powerful insights and awareness of the greatness within, is to descend into the depressing depths of poverty, where real personal growth happens. Bly equates this process with the ancient Greek term katabasis, or the descent, which serves to acquaint the initiate with his own depression, frailties and vulnerabilities, in order to challenge his ego. When this event occurs, he no longer feels like he is special. He loses his job, self-respect, social standing, and the grandiose prince is transformed for a time into an isolated derelict. Myths are full of the hero and his catabasis. Oedipus, the arrogant king, becomes a helpless blind man. The biblical hero Joseph is thrown into a well by his brothers, and later still, ends up in the pharaoh's dungeon. Even the mighty Hercules spends a year as a slave, dressed in drag, in humiliation. In our world, even heroes such as Nelson Mandela, originally a violent socialist, became a universal hero because of the way his own catabasis on Robben Island transformed his thinking on peace and racial reconciliation. Bly tells us that the catabasis serves as a form of discharge, the tragedy of which necessarily must be dealt with on a conscious level, sometimes the first time a man has ever had to do so. For many men today, unemployment, divorce or bankruptcy is the most significant type of catabasis. Bly tells us, In divorce, when a man's emotional safety may disintegrate, he can either walk backward through the door while watching funny movies, or he can try to take in the true darkness of the door as he faces it. The sense of inadequacy among demands for more money, the felt rejection and isolation as the community withdraws some of its approval and support, self-doubt, all these add up to a new sort of loneliness. The man can use the divorce, like any other serious collapse, as an invitation to go through the door, accept the catabasis, immerse himself in his wound, and exit his old life through it. In the story, our boy becomes a kitchen hand 
and spends his time doing menial tasks. It's no coincidence that he is employed in the kitchen. In castles, the kitchen was usually located in the bowels of the building, and the association with ashes has long been synonymous with death. Initiation rituals across the world often smother the candidate in ashes and or leave him in a dark grave in order to die to his old self, the child self, bonded to the mother, and to be reborn to his new, adult, masculine self, bonded by brotherhood to the men of his tribe. In our culture, lacking proper initiation rituals under the mentorship of older men, many of us experience our time of ashes, or the death of our inflated youthful ambitions, in the many unfulfilled fantasies and collapsed enterprises that can leave us hollow, lonely, and regrettably commonly, suicidal. It is interesting to note that in cultures where ritual catabasis and ashing by mentors occurs, few men ever experience the instability of emotion and depression that has so characterized men of our own culture. This hunger for the presence of the father plays itself out in myths as the desire to be in the presence of the king, who lives in lofty heights with godly characteristics of his own. But the golden hair, which symbolizes the mark of heaven, makes us uncomfortable in the presence of a king, who already radiates divine power, and it would be awkward to boast about such things, so we try to keep it hidden, and usually find ourselves being dismissed as inadequate, so we end up back in the kitchen, to ash our faces again until we are more mature, or worthy to step into the sunshine. It's interesting to note that, despite his own supposed wisdom, the king couldn't see past the boy's charade, something that all of us fathers should try to keep in mind. There will come a time where we must move from the basement to a new environment that will serve to help us grow further and rise from the ashes of failure. Remember, so far, our boy prince has failed in virtually every undertaking, from fumbling his golden ball, to pinching his finger, supervising the golden pool, struggling to survive in the outside world, only now to embarrass himself before the king and get himself fired from the kitchen. A walled garden, such as was common in much of antiquity, gives us the opportunity for sunshine and fresh air, but also for a sheltered and organised environment, away from the wild and random outdoors. Typically, these gardens were places where unusual and exotic plants were cultivated, in prepared beds, lovingly nurtured and cared for. Gardens are conspicuous for their boundaries, for the need to pay attention to minute details and the energy expended in cultivating precious specimens. They are the sheltered place where flowers and fruits are metaphors for ideas that are cultivated from organized labor. Gardens are places for introspection and for the expression of emotions, particularly those such as love and longing, which is why so many fairy tale love affairs happen in castle gardens. I and John wanted our boy to experience time in the garden, to cultivate these qualities and to become familiar with boundaries. A man without boundaries allows others to walk all over him. He is naive in his perceptions of the world and is easily taken advantage of by both men and women. A man who sets firm boundaries and cultivates the garden of his mind, matures into a man capable of becoming a warrior and servant of a higher purpose. The king's daughter represents the worldly demands of others for the gold hidden under your hat. Bly tells us that young men should beware not to show off their talents too early or easily, lest we become prone to boastfulness and arrogance. In the presence of the king's daughter, who dispenses gold coins as a payment or a tip, 
His golden hair is merely a novelty to her, so the boy runs away in embarrassment. Insofar as receiving payment in gold coins for the labours of working in the garden, it might be that the gardener himself is a part of our own subconscious, like Iron John, whose role in the initiate is to condition and develop our feelings and passions, but to always keep them within due bounds. Giving gold coins to the gardener's children is the feel-good reward we give ourselves for the many small achievements that condition our behaviour for bigger things to come. In a sense, it may also be emblematical of passing on our good fortune to others who are less mature. It eventually came to pass that the territory the boy was presently living in was attacked by a powerful neighbouring kingdom, and the king was gravely concerned that they would soon be conquered by an army that significantly outnumbered his own. The gardener's boy now said, I am quite grown now and I will go to war if you'll just give me a horse. The soldiers of the castle garrison laughed and told him, When we've gone, you go look in the stable and we'll certainly leave a horse behind for you to catch up. But when he did so, all he found was an old, lame horse who could barely walk, let alone gallop. So the boy slowly rode him toward the dark forest, and when he got there, yelled out, Iron John! Iron John! Iron John! Just as he had been told if he ever needed help. And sure enough, Iron John suddenly appeared before him. What is it you want? asked Iron John. I want a war horse so I can ride into battle like the other soldiers fighting for the king. You will have that, and much more besides, said Iron John, as he turned and vanished back into the undergrowth. Presently, a stable boy emerged from the woods, leading an enormous stallion with flared nostrils and a fiery disposition that made him hard to handle. Exchanging his lame horse for the new one, he mounted him and, as he was about to ride off, a regiment of fully armed knights in gleaming battle armour emerged from the forest and rode up alongside. As they made their way to the battlefield, it became apparent that many of the king's men had already been slain, and the few remaining units were close to being completely routed by the enemy. The boy and his regiment lowered their lances and rode at full speed, completely surprising the enemy as they smashed into its flank, crushing the infantry under hoof. Pursuing them relentlessly, they cut down the invaders with sword and mace till there was barely a man left alive to return to their own country. But instead of riding back to the king's banner, the regiment circled away and back to the dark forest where he called out for Iron John three times, just as before. "'What do you want?' asked Iron John, as he emerged from the foliage. "'You can take back your horse and men, and return the lame old nag to me, if you please,' replied the boy. It all happened just as he wished, and he slowly made his way back to the castle. The king, meanwhile, had already returned, and despite the triumphant reception and adoring hugs of his daughter, he was bewildered and told her just how, when all seemed lost, a strange knight and his regiment appeared out of nowhere and took the field in an astonishing and heroic charge upon the enemy. The king's daughter asked who this strange knight was, but the king was at a loss, not recognising any of the livery or battle standards, nor having a chance to honour him personally, as he had vanished in pursuit of the fleeing enemy. The girl, suspicious, sought out the gardener and asked about the whereabouts of his young assistant, but he laughed and replied that he had just now returned mounted atop his three-legged nag. Others that saw him ride in also mocked and made fun of him, asking how the battle went for him, for which he replied, It went well enough, I fought hard and it's lucky I was there, who knows how it might have ended if I wasn't. 
to which the others in the courtyard erupted in raucous laughter. In fairy tales, battles, invasions and enemies often represent the chaotic internal forces that resist or block our personal development. They are the trials that threaten to undermine all our hard work and investment and at times can appear to be overwhelming, as in this story where even the king is unsure if he can win. So the boy wants to confront the enemy but has at his disposal only a lame horse. Horses symbolize raw, masculine, instinctual power, but a lame horse is one that is not quite right, nor is it fit for the task. Bly tells us that the lameness of the horse represents the shame that holds us back from projecting our full power in the world. The shaming of parents, school teachers, church leaders, more macho lads in the team, more successful friends, narcissistic spouses, or even our own perfectionism, all can undermine our ability to act decisively. When we were children, our little horses, says Bly, had all four legs and galloped around joyfully and confidently wherever they wanted, until social and cultural pressures hobbled our exuberance by the age of 12. The story seems to imply that we need to seek out the aid of a mentor who can regale us with a mighty horse worthy of our intentions and even if it is only temporary it can help us win some early victories that will put us on a steady track of progress and later independence. The king continued to be troubled by the mysterious knight who had saved his army from annihilation, and his daughter was similarly motivated to discover who this heroic warrior was, for her own feminine reasons. So they concocted a plan to hold a festival in honour of their victory, and they would give an open invitation to every knight of the realm to participate in chivalric games culminating in the prize of a golden apple each day to the winning knight, who would surely be unmasked as the same hero of the recent battle. Sure enough, scores of would-be champions swarmed to the castle, and our boy Goldilocks once again made his way to the dark forest, upon his lame horse, to ask Iron John to help him compete in the games. What do you need? asked Iron John. To win the golden apple at the tournament, replied our protagonist. Very well, you shall have it then, replied the wild man. I'll provide you with red armour and a chestnut horse. As the tournament began, nobody recognised him and he soon defeated the other knights who were also scrambling to win the golden apple, thrown by the king's daughter into the melee. Snatching the apple, the Red Knight rode off without revealing his identity, to the great disappointment of both King and crowd. The second day of the tournament now came around, and Iron John fitted out the boy this time in white armour and a white horse. As yesterday, the boy again snatched the golden apple and rode off before anyone could discover his identity. Furious, the king raged to his guards. This is unacceptable. The champion is supposed to show proper respect to the king by removing his helmet and showing us his face. If he wins the apple for the third time tomorrow, you will give chase and arrest him. If need be, strike him a blow with your swords until he submits. The third day of the tournament now came, and this time, Iron John fitted the champion out in black armour and a black horse. Yet again he prevailed over the other knights and yet again made his escape with the golden apple. But this time guards had positioned themselves at the exits and mounted a spirited chase through the countryside. Eventually one of the pursuers came close enough 
to draw his sword and strike him upon the leg, wounding him. He managed to escape, however, but as his horse leaped over a hedge, the force of the jump dislodged his helmet and it flew off, revealing the golden hair and identity of our champion. The guards now halted and returned to the castle to inform the king. The next day, the princess went to the gardener to ask about the golden-haired boy. He's at work in the garden today, but the crazy kid was away at the festival the entire time and only returned last night with three golden apples that he let my kids play with. It wasn't long before the king summoned the boy to come before him. So he approached the throne again with his cap on his head. But the king's daughter walked right up to him and took it off, with his golden locks of hair falling down over his shoulders, dazzling the entire court by how handsome he was. Are you the knight who came every day to the festival, each time in different colours, to catch the golden apples? asked the king. Yes, sire, and here are the apples, taking them out of his pocket and holding them up for everyone to see. If you desire further proof, I can show you the wound I sustained from your men on my last escape. But mark that I am also the knight who helped you snatch victory from the jaws of disaster against your enemies. If you can perform such deeds of valour, you cannot possibly be a simple gardener's boy. Tell me, who is your father? My father is a mighty king, and I myself have gold in such quantities as I should ever desire, said the boy. It is clear, said the king, that I owe a great debt of thanks to you. Is there anything I can do for you to adequately honour your service? Yes, there is, said the golden-haired boy. You can give me your daughter as my bride. The princess laughed out loud as the court murmured over the brazen demand. But I have already long known by his golden hair that he was no gardener's boy, said the princess. And then she walked right up to him and kissed him in front of everybody. Again, the court erupted in gasps of shock. Sure enough, a wedding was soon held in the castle, with the boy's parents invited to travel from their own distant realm to attend, delighted to once again see their son, having given up all hope of ever seeing him alive again. But just as they prepared to attend the wedding feast, the huge dining hall doors flung open and a stately looking king entered, accompanied by a great and noble retinue. He strode right up to the couple, embraced the groom and said, I am Iron John. All this time I was under an enchantment in the appearance of a wild man, but you have set me free and all the treasures which I possess shall now be your property. And, as in all such fairy tales, they all lived happily ever after. In many myths, apples, particularly golden ones, denote a gift of immortality or some other divine life-affirming boon that is bestowed by a goddess. Apples have usually been associated with feminine divine grace. The princess throwing an apple as a prize to the champion is symbolic of her selecting a sexual mate, where in so many such stories of competing champions, the prize is both union with the princess and, by virtue of her hand in marriage, your own inheritance of her kingdom, or in anthropological terms we could say her uterus for a man's greatest treasure has always been his children. 
The three colours invested by the wild man into his young novice have long been a part of mythological imagery throughout not just Europe, but indeed all around the world. Red is the colour of blood, of anger, rage, heat, action and animation. It is the colour of Mars, the god of war, in many cultures. It is also the colour that can represent the female principle, being emblematic of menstrual blood, so it can be used symbolically in a variety of metaphors and sequences depending on whether a story is geared towards boys or girls. We have to remember that for the vast majority of our time on this earth, we had no system of writing. Our traditions, teachings and culture were transmitted orally and pictorially with a rich tapestry of imagery, costume, adornments and ritual that seems quaint to us today but carried enormous emotional potency in the transmission of knowledge to the ancients. White has long been associated with purity, honour, chastity and virtue, as well as the radiance of sunlight and snow, the richness of milk and the holiness of the bread of life. In medieval times, it came to be associated with the chivalric qualities of righteousness and cleanliness of spirit. Black in many cultures is associated with death, stillness, night and the mysteries that go unseen. By extension, it relates to the mystical experience of death of the passions and a rebirth to the knowledge of deeper things. Being left in darkness with your own thoughts and fears is a common element of initiation rituals today. The dark is the abyss where your demons lurk. White glows and reflects outwardly from itself, while black absorbs all colours and light into itself. So the black knight absorbs all emotions and remains dispassionate, aloof, but also ominous, for his silence and circumspection. Myths place the sequence of appearance of colours in their stories variably, as mentioned before, depending on the intended recipient. Bly tells us that in stories directed at masculine initiation, the sequence of red, white, and then black represents the developmental path necessary for men's progress in the world. So it's no coincidence that the livery of the golden-haired boy's horses and armour varies during the days of the festival, each of which may symbolically represent a decade or more of a man's life. Red, as mentioned before, is the colour of Mars, of war, of projected power. Aggression, courage, risk-taking and self-assurance are the first qualities inculcated into boys in many tribal cultures. But remaining in this stage long term can cause a man to lack self-control, scruples, respect for others, sophistication or subtlety. An overly red man may become incredibly brave, but also reckless. Women are attracted to the red man because he is often spontaneous, decisive and excitingly dangerous, but he is an unfinished and crude individual whose emphasis on personal ambition and power makes for a poor long-term partner. He can also be overly brutal, unmerciful and unconcerned with the welfare of the vulnerable, a trait that even chimpanzee alpha males ignore at their peril. As a man is guided to maturity by his mentors, he ought to transcend from the passionate red into the noble white, who is characterised by making moral, unselfish choices and for living under the rule of law. In this phase we see the development of self-control and social awareness, as well as a growing personal spirituality. The white knight, unlike the red, is motivated by his lofty ideals rather than personal gain. St. George, being the archetype of the sacrificial white knight, rode a white horse when killing the dragon. Even in more recent depictions, such as cowboy westerns, we have the Lone Ranger 
and a whole host of good guys in the movies that always seem to ride a white stallion. Many mothers, as well as our modern educational system, raise boys to be white knights right from the start, and to have their sons bypass or be purged of the crude and distasteful red stage. This process, aiming to eliminate what has been termed toxic masculinity, may result in an unbalanced man who lacks any kind of gravitas or seriousness. Contrast this with mothers of the ancient world, from Sparta to Japan to the Navajo or Maasai, who understood that it was necessary for their sons to be both civilized and dangerous if their society was to be safeguarded from the chaos of life. The stealing of the key from under the mother's pillow is a totally Freudian metaphor for transferring the power of the mother over the emotional development of a boy to that of the men in his life. But as successive generations of men have themselves lacked proper initiation into masculinity by absent or Peter Pan fathers, and a society that views traditional masculinity as unacceptable, the cycle of dysfunction has accelerated. As any kind of imbalance is ultimately unhealthy, an overly white knight risks becoming a moralizing know-it-all. Such men are notorious for their virtue signaling on every conceivable patriarchal evil. They spend their time looking for causes to support and damsels to rescue, rather than getting on with the real business of making their mark on the world. When it comes to relationships, they often overly idealize women, placing them on pedestals, projecting romantic and unrealistic fantasies upon them, in an age where women are increasingly taught that they don't need a knight in shining armor. These men orbit and flatter women subserviently in the hope of being rewarded for their meekness with sex, but inevitably they end up friend-zoned and frustrated. They like to think of themselves as progressive and supportive nice guys, but when the girl of their dreams shows no interest, despite all of their attention and ministrations, and instead sleeps with some random jerk or tough guy, he can quickly become cynical, depressed, and, ironically, far more misogynistic than a red, for whom women are always of a low priority. Many white knights in our society have had to go through the red phase they skipped as boys in their 40s, after the life-shattering experience of divorce from a woman who they discover never had any respect for him. The suicide rate among this group suggests a skewed development that, lacking a proper initiation, leaves him with scars later rather than sooner. It's no coincidence that taking the red pill has become a metaphor in the men's rights movement for rejecting the white knight paradigm boys are being increasingly raised in today. Assuming a man has been guided through the first two phases, Later in his life, as he reflects upon his wide experience, it is natural to expect him to finally mature into the black phase. He is now a man who can see things as they really are, without the filters of personal ambition or idealistic zealotry. He looks for the practicality, even humour, of any given situation, as he tries to navigate the remainder of his life in harmony with his environment. In this state, clarity of vision increases and a man moves, usually in his fifties, from statesman to sage. Mythology is full of wise sages who carry crippling wounds and as a result move slowly and thoughtfully through the world. Their scars and disfigurements belie the transformation from physical to spiritual power and their permanent wounds remind them of the suffering of all people, so they consequently manifest a true empathy towards others and a fearlessness of death that is calm rather than reckless. It's only in this phase that a man is truly ready to become a mentor to younger men, 
or an elder in his own community. As a fully qualified initiate, complete with the scar of transformation, he is ready to become a custodian of masculine laws and a keeper of secret men's business. Having been so initiated, a man may now be said to be a warrior, a judge and a priest. He would be considered qualified to sit in council, to defend his community, to head a family of his own and be expected to lay down his life for them without hesitation. He would be justified in claiming his rightful honours without scruple and without diffidence. All the time our boy was in the foreign kingdom, he hid his identity and refused to accept any personal reward for his labours or acknowledgement and public acclaim for his martial skills, continuing to labour in the garden and riding a lame horse whenever in public. But now, having finally been identified, it is clear that his time has come and he confidently asserts himself before the world. It is interesting to note that the princess knew he was special very early on, but didn't tell her father about it until he had proven himself through the three colours of the golden apple contest. Clearly, she was waiting to see what he was made of before bringing him home to meet Daddy. We don't know if during the entire time he was in the castle, our golden boy spent every waking moment daydreaming about marrying the beautiful princess. But his valour in war and eventual confidence in demanding her hand in marriage suggests he probably didn't. Boys caught up in constant yearning over a girl they have a crush on would hardly make such a bold and assertive request of her father in front of the entire world. They are usually too wrapped up in their own fantasies and lacked the machismo to make such a move. Most overly white knight teenage boys today would probably agree that secret, undeclared romantic fantasy is safer than the risk and pain of rejection. Each of the phases he went through helped to mould our boy into the kind of man worthy of marrying such a noble, feisty and obviously savvy woman and to himself some day be called upon to govern a kingdom. We see this in his eventual reunion with his parents, who, like so many of us, fear the disappointment of our children being unworthy of the blood and treasure we pour into their upbringing. The boy has undergone a most profound quest, and it turns out he now has all the qualities his parents feared they would never see come to fruition. But, perhaps just as importantly, the transformation of the wild man back into his proper state, being a powerful and wealthy king, suggests that the story isn't just about the initiation of a boy, but also of the restoration of a downtrodden man back to his proper state of dignity. Remember that I and John lay submerged and isolated in the deepest part of a forest pond, hairy, dishevelled and frightening. He was captured, humiliatingly kept in a cage and mocked like an animal. But in our story we see him gain his freedom and gradually rise back to resplendent nobility at the wedding feast of a boy he guided through the challenges of initiation. Mentoring the boy was his own way of redemption and personal transformation, and such themes have been popularised in modern stories such as Star Wars, The Matrix, and Lord of the Rings. Initiation, then, is clearly as much about the men doing the initiating as it is about the boys undergoing the ceremony. It suggests to us that men of all ages need a community of other men in order to function properly and that we need to take responsibility for one another in order to reclaim our rightful dignity lost in the enchantments or some might say curse of a modern world out of touch with the needs of men and boys today. <laughs>